Good evening. Welcome. My name is Carly D'Amato. I'm the Director of Upper School of Mission at Springside Chestnut Hill Academy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Upper School Academic Overview Information Session. Um, tonight, you are going to be hearing from our department chairs, uh, from our English, our history, our math, science, and world language departments. Um, and they're here to give you an overview of what your child will come to expect and experience as a member of the upper school community. Um, so they have, all, or actually I'll introduce you. Let's see if I can get everyone on the screen so that you can see these are our department chairs. Um, I will have, you guys are all waving your hands. You got Scott Stein, he's the science department chair. Derek, he is our math department chair. Sarah is our history department chair, Becky is our English department chair, and Steph is our, our world language department chair. So they are all here to um, give you an overview of the academic experience in the upper school, after which um, there is an opportunity for you to submit any questions that you may have. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should have a Q&A feature. So feel free to submit any questions that you may have for any of these teachers. They are here to answer questions for you. Um, so without further ado, I want to pass, I'm actually, I'm gonna put our, presentation up on the screen so that you can see it. And I'm going to pass the uh, the mic to Becky. Hi, good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to see all of you. <laughs> Lovely to gather even virtually. Um, I am the chair of the English department here at SCH, and I am honored to be um, embarking on this journey. It's my first year here, um, but I'm thrilled to talk to all of you a bit about our upper school English program. Um, Carly, I do not have the little arrows on my screen. There we go. There they are. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So um, here at SCH, we have a robust and rigorous English curriculum. We, um, in the ninth grade, actually, I think I went one ahead. There we go. So what we like to say is we really seek to cultivate a lifelong passion in our students for reading, writing, discovering themselves as students and engaging deeply in texts. We have um, a course sequence that begins in ninth grade where the focus is on the individual and society. In 10th grade, we look at uh, world voices and our course is reading the world. In 11th grade, we focus on American stories. And then in 12th grade, we offer a wonderful variety of English electives and AP courses. I'm gonna go into a bit more depth into these as I talk. We also offer honors classes in all of our grade levels. And those are offered if space allows and if students are referred to them in grades 10 through 12. We really try and encourage our students to identify questions about text, to share opinions, to wrestle and grapple with a lot of big ideas. We focus on persuasive writing. Um, we encourage them to have multiple interpretations and to really use writing as a means of creative expression. So throughout our curriculum, we look at contemporary literature and classic literature. We also look at um, all different forms of writing, poetry, plays, nonfiction, it's written, you name it, we teach it. Um, and we do a big emphasis on close reading and analytical writing. So in our ninth grade curriculum, some of the texts that we read are We Are Not Free by Tracy Chi. We read Antigone by Sophocles, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury and I Am Their American Dream. Um, in all of our courses at every grade level, there's sort of set texts that we look at, which we really look at the curriculum each year and think about what we may teach or change or adapt for the following year. But we're also always reading short stories, poetry, plays, and other supplemental texts. In 10th grade, we read Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. That's our summer read. We um, examine Night by Elie Wiesel. We read Othello by Shakespeare in a contemporary novel by a Japanese author called Clara and the Sun. And then in 11th grade for the American Stories Year, students read The Great Gatsby by Fitzgerald, Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien and Angels in America. Um, also exciting for uh, 11th graders is if space permits in their schedule, they are eligible to um, take elective courses as well. 
So some of our electives, um, well, actually, I'm sorry, in 12th grade, some of our electives, which are typically semester long electives, the courses I just went through are year long courses. We have a wonderful sampling of electives that speak to writing, that speak to different genres of literature, that speak to film. So some of the electives that we have included and typically we do include annually our creative writing, a wonderful class called Monsters and the Monstrous in Literature, a focus on dystopian literature, film as text, introduction to journalism, and a course that focuses on social justice in text, which is called intertextuality. We also offer two AP courses, AP Lit and Composition and AP Language and Composition. Um, at the honors level, which we offer in ninth through 11th grade, you know, students are really encouraged and guided to look at more complex texts and to develop more nuanced writing. Uh, students that are in honors level courses are expected to analyze literature at greater depths and to write more precisely, to show greater independence in their writing, and to really take more ownership over the topics that they want to investigate in literature and what will spark their own curiosity. Honors level, level, honors level text in all the um, grade levels typically draw from what is being taught in the CP courses, the college prep courses, but more supplemental texts and higher level texts are brought in to supplement those as well. So I really am very passionate about teaching English and I absolutely love it. Um, I always think about when I walk into a classroom, you know, what, what are the things I want to see? I also have the great privilege of observing and sitting in on English classes. So at this point in the year, I've been in every single classroom, every single upper school English teacher's classroom, as well as my own, which I teach in every day. And some things that I see in those classrooms that just inspire me continuously as an English teacher and as the chair of the department is extremely detailed and nuanced discussions about literature through various lenses, such as the feminist lens, the Marxist lens, the psychoanalytic lens. Students have uh, student-led Harkness discussions where they are grappling with topics, building off of each other's points of view, providing evidence. Uh, students making connections with texts they've read in other grade levels across other disciplines. Uh, students making connections with their own lives and then with the world around them. I'm always seeing students exploring literary devices, simile, metaphor, personification, and using those in their writing and just in their speaking skills. Uh, there's a deep focus on analytical writing in our English department, and that really we, you know, we encourage students to make strong claims that are arguments that can be wrestled with and then use evidence from the text they're reading to really support what they are um, arguing. And students who are just so engaged in reading closely and critically, I think if you were to step into one of our English classes, you would just be amazed at how engaged students are. And it's, like I said earlier, a privileged and really an honor to be a part of that. So I'm happy to take any questions at the end, but I will pass the torch along to our next, um, to Sarah, who is the chair of our history department. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah McDowell. I'm the history department chair. Um, I have been teaching at SCH um, about 16 years. Um, and I, um, before that, I'm a career change teacher. Before that, I was an attorney um, and then moved into teaching history. I've taught in the middle school for boys and in the upper school. Um, and I've had sons go through the school. So I can tell you um, from a lot of different perspectives uh, what it's like um, to have students at SCH. So for the history department, what I did is I took a lot of pictures of various classes um, uh, so that you can kind of see what the, the classes are like. And this is my 11th grade class saying hello to everybody. Um, when we um, looked at the history department curriculum about, about seven years ago now, um, we asked ourselves a question, when students graduate from SCH, what do we want them to know about the world they live in and what do we want them to be able to do? Um, and so we, we crafted our curriculum around that. Um, and what we want them to know uh, is enough about their world, the world they live in, so that they can be really well-informed citizens of their world um, and of their country. Um, 
And uh, we also want them to really grapple with some of the difficult questions of history. History um, is a messy process. Um, there's a lot of uh, difficult things we discuss in our history classes. I mean, it gives them a chance to really grapple with these various perspectives and ideas in a really safe way um, so that they can really build their thinking when they go out into the world, they kind of can figure out who they are um, and uh, how they want to approach their world. Um, so that's our, our philosophy. Um, what we, oops, I went too far, I'm sorry. Hang on, there we go. Um, this is from uh, my 10th grade class with, with modern world history class. They're doing a project together as a group. That's what that picture shows. Um, so in ninth grade, we have different levels of classes. CP means college prep, honors, H is honors, and then AP is advanced placement. Every year, every kid is evaluated um, for where in that series of placements they're going to thrive. Um, they're all very vigorous courses. They learn a lot. They follow similar content, um, but they're geared towards kids who are passionate and love to read and really love to write. That might be an honors kid. Kids who are still working on those skills, kids who um, need to get a little more engaged in history, um, that might be a CP kid. So we just look at each kid each year and make sure they're placed where they're going to thrive. In ninth grade, um, foundations of the modern world. So we have ninth and 10th grade as, a, as a two, two world history courses that work together. So ninth grade starts, um, we learn world religions so that they can have a good sense of the, the religions that still are alive in the world today, what their foundations are, how they impact people. We look at world trade systems. Um, we, we travel through each of the continents basically to make sure kids have a sense of what kind of people live there, what their deep roots of the culture, um, what, where do the deep roots of culture come from? Then in 10th grade, um, and that, that class, ninth grade, ends in um, the Americas pre-contact, so pre-1492. Modern world history starts um, at the combination of the two worlds, the old and the new, um, the Atlantic slave trade and all the colonization of the Americas. Um, and uh, then we move forward in time until we end in the modern world. Um, and uh, right now we're, um, we're in the imperialism uh, portion of that unit in, in 10th grade. 11th grade is a survey course of American history, um, uh, and it starts in the colonial period and moves into the modern world. In 12th grade, kids who kids are not required to take history, they may if they choose to, but they don't have to. Um, so uh, we offer um, electives, uh, which are true electives, um, to uh, to to 11th graders and 12th graders. And this is a list of some of our electives. Um, this is a simulation. The image is a simulation in the AP government class. That's a super active class. Um, they do a lot of really interesting projects and activities. Um, but here they are having a, um, um, it's the UN and they're, um, they're negotiating um, something in the UN there. Um, that class, in fact, just um, they did a, a project where they had to take some action um, in government, and a lot of them just went out and were pool workers, and some were translators at the polls, which was really exciting. Um, and so our electives, we have um, two APs, AP Government, which I just talked about, AP Art History, and Philadelphia is a great place for an AP Art History course because of all the wonderful museums. Um, we have a few honors courses. One is the Global Slavery course, which is quite popular with the kids. Um, and then there's an environmental history course that's been offered. Um, and then some other popular courses, popular culture is a wonderful way to look at uh, how history impacts culture. Oh, somebody's changing me along. Um, so uh, anyway, so you can see this, but they're really exciting electives. We tend to be pretty broad in our electives in terms of um, uh, kind of more social studies oriented, um, whereas our, our core classes are more history oriented. Okay, so what kids do in a history class? Um, we do the basics. We do, um, we learn facts. Um, we learn dates. Um, we learn geography. In fact, all of the 10th grade has to name most of the countries of the world by the time they're done 10th grade and be able to identify them. So we do that basic history stuff. But we also really try to make history come alive for kids, um, to make it exciting, to make it interactive, to make them really grapple with these issues. Um, that are 
um, uh, still alive today, right? Maybe they happened in the past, but the, some of the same things are still in the world today and still making people um, really grapple with difficult decisions. So these are all images from history classes of various ways um, that we try to get them to make claims, support them with evidence, ask questions that are important, um, to look at various perspectives. Um, a lot of times we'll have them um, prep two perspectives and then have to you know, engage in some kind of dialogue about that and then switch sides so that they can really wrestle with the issues. Um, we do a lot of visual analysis because kids live in a visual world today and they need to be really critical of visual sources the same way they're critical of written sources. Um, and uh, we also make sure that kids are doing a lot of the learning on their own. We, we don't want to be sages on the stage. We don't want to be telling them everything they need to know for the test. Um, we want them to start to explore and to really try to um, learn on their own. Um, there's a one of these images, the one in the center is of the kids getting ready for a graded discussion where they have to like not not debate issues, but really unpack the why of history. Why did people act in the way they did? What are the factors that caused it? What impact did it have on people? All those kind of really important history questions. Um, one of the things that we want them to do um, when they graduate from SCH, SCH is to be able to propose a question, research the answer, and write an analytical paper kind of arguing their answer. Um, and we're really proud of how we've scaffolded that um, throughout the history curriculum. Um, um, so from ninth to 11th grade, um, they learn how to do those things. Research, uh, think of a question, research it, figure out, be really critical of their sources so that they don't get tripped up by misinformation. Um, and then write an, a, a research paper. I've put a few of the research topics kids pursued um, down at the bottom, they write the most interesting papers. They love these papers. It takes forever. And I can't say they love citation, but they learn it. Um, and they um, are so proud when they're done. Um, they start in ninth grade with a kind of a four page paper, and then they end up writing an eight to 10 page paper by the time they graduate. It's hard. Um, they get a ton of support along the way. They have a lot of time to do it. And we conference with every kid um, uh, probably five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, depending on how often they ask us. So um, it's a really great process, and we're really proud of it. Um, and then I'm going to run out of time, so I will. Um, this is just uh, the a few things. Um, uh, every time a kid comes back to visit, um, which they do pretty frequently, um, I ask them what we did to prepare them well, um, what we could do better. Um, and this is from two of our graduates, what they had to say about going through the history program at SEH. Um, so if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can ask them afterwards. But I am now going to turn it over to the math department. All right. Thank you, Sarah. So this is the point where everyone thinks back to high school and it's like, oh, this is my favorite segment coming up. It's all about math. I love history and English, but I've been waiting for this all night. Um, actually, if if I would have had my school, would have had some of the electives that English and history had here. I may not have actually pursued math. Um, OK, so my name is Derek Keister, chair of the math department. Um, this is what I love. This is what I like to talk about, maybe more than I should sometimes. But uh, let me give you a little bit of an overview here of our, our program. So what you're looking at is our sequence of options. And one of the things that I love about being at SCH is that um, for math, what I might be used to or you might be used to is that we don't track students. We don't funnel them into certain classes and then say you're you're stuck at that level or whatever. We sequence. And to Sarah's point earlier, we reevaluate every student's level of ability, challenge, support every single year, sometimes within the year. And we, we move them accordingly based on what they want to be able to achieve versus what they are achieving and where they want to go. Um, and the awesome part of our program is no matter where you start on the left side in the three levels of geometry, you actually, every student in our program has access to some level of calculus before they leave our program on top of the electives that we offer that range from three different levels of statistics to discrete math, linear algebra, multivariable. Some of these things have to happen in a certain order so that you have the prerequisites for them. Um, we do require four years of math, but the, the sequence in which you go um, and how you move, say, up, down, left, right, or around in the program um, is kind of up to you and how much 
uh, work your student puts into it versus also their interest level. Um, so we finish with things of AP Calc, AB, and BC, which always happens. We have an honors calc, we have a diff calc, um, and that pretty much goes with 12th grade working backwards, 11th grade is some level of pre-calc, 10th grade is some level of algebra two, and ninth grade would be some level of geometry. Electives typically happen um, amongst the 11th and 12th grade years. There's really only one elective that has a prerequisite, and that's the multivariable. You have to have single variable calc um, in advance. And what I also like about our placement decisions is that, um, again, what you might be used to or what I'm used to from when I was in school is that you'd have a score or a test, and that would kind of you know dictate where you could or couldn't go. Uh, that's probably like one third or one fourth of how we place people. We look at their current achievement. We look at their current level. We look at their different test scores, their SATs, their PSATs. If they're already in an AP course, what did they get? Um, and then also equally important, in my opinion, is we look at the student and the human that is sitting in front of us of how are they doing and what are their interests and what are their motivation and where do they want to go? And we put all of that together into a, a, a nice uh, placement decision as we try to figure out where best to balance support and challenge. So with that, some of the electives that we have, as I mentioned, are the AP calcs, the multivariable. Um, multivariable is taking calc and doing it in three dimensions. So it's got a lot of engineering and physics relationships. So we usually have students that are interested in that kind of route that try to push themselves to make it to the multivariable. Um, linear algebra and discrete. Linear algebra has a lot of applications uh, in computer sciences and data storage. Discrete mathematics is the idea of how do I count really large sets of things that I can't actually see or touch or hold, which um, if you ever, if your student ever wants to consider, you know, code breaking or working for like the NSA or something, that's the hot button course to take because um, you need that kind of thing to, to break the big codes and stuff like that. Um, and then a, a whole subsection of our program is a really robust statistics uh, set of classes. Um, I My master's was in STEM education, and one of the things that I, I feel that I learned a lot of was that you have all those different subjects that go together, but the crossroads that kind of makes all four of them relate is statistics. Um, pretty much all roads, in my opinion, lead through statistics, and it's one of the most useful mathematics across a range of students once they graduate. So we have something that is college prep level, we have something that is honors level, which is a lot of simulation based, lots of applets on the computer. Um, lots of like actually counting and doing simulations by hand. I think Mrs. Kraft has them like flipping coins in class and um, they measure themselves like height and they do distances of throwing things and basketball. Um, we throw different like objects or um, uh, some like Barbie dolls and stuff over the railing to see like bungee jumping and all this kind of cool stuff to make it realistic. And then you have a little bit of that in AP, but of course also preparing them for the, the AP stat exam at the end. So a couple of things to think about, like what happens in our classes and what it looks like. I actually wish I could take um, the, the slide that Sarah had from history where it talked about collaborative and creative and connections, um, which maybe people don't always think about as much for math, but I could actually insert that into a slide here for the math program as well. Um, we're trying not to be upfront talking and telling and doing the math. Students have way more math ability innate than, than we or they give them credit selves give themselves credit for sometimes. Um, and so we're trying to draw out what is their natural ability, even if it's right or wrong, because then we can kind of tweak and refine and, and change and help. Um, so some of the ways that we do that in a classroom are, uh, first off, every student comes into the upper school program in ninth grade, and they are given a uh, TI Inspire handheld calculator, which is also an, a computer algebra system. It can pretty much do any kind of graphing, geometry, algebra skills, or concepts that you would see on any kind of applet online. Um, we give that to the students. It's used in a variety of ways in different classes. In my room, for example, I actually can hook it up to the board and students can present what's on their calculator screen to the rest of the class to kind of share and show what they're doing. Other teachers use it to share files and do like interactive activities on their calculators. It right now is the leading computer algebra system handheld um, device for teaching math that is out there. 
Every student gets one when they come through our program. They have it the whole four years and they learn to use it through those four years. Um, I'm sure many people have heard about Desmos because schools use it all the time. This is the very robust online free version. I actually think a version of this is what's going to be roped into the math SATs when they go digital in like 2024. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. It's the same idea. It's a little bit bigger screen because you're using your laptop, but it's dynamic. And the important thing of using dynamic technology and mathematics is to study the relationship between two quantities. So it's not just about using a formula or a procedure to get an answer, but it's more about if I change this in the table, what will happen in the graph? And then what will happen in the equation? And you create what we call linked representations, make students much smarter with mathematics over time. Um, and then what we're also trying to do in our program is along the same lines is like diversify how we assess. It's not just all about a quiz or test or homework for math. And this is difficult in different classes of how you how you do this, but I think we have a pretty good range over all of our AP honors and CP and elective classes, but we try to use a lot of interactive dynamic activities with the technologies I mentioned above. We try alternative forms of assessment. So projects, um, different classes have students write, um, I just had my AP Calc students submitting a, um, actually I lied, all three of my classes today had to submit a uh, video kind of journal prompt response where they videoed themselves talking about some like bigger conceptual questions. So things like that. We do presentations, lots of projects in the stat classes and electives. We still have the traditional assessments. Some students um, cater towards that. They, they, they like that. They can show a lot about them on that. Um, other students don't. And then what we're we're really uh, striving to do is to also make the mathematics collaborative. Mathematicians in the real world don't work in isolation. And 90% of the time, at least the departments I've seen, uh, you also get to kind of pick what you're going to study and work on as a, you know, a doctorate of mathematics. So we try to emulate that a little bit in the classrooms of here's what we need to actually do, but how do you want to go about doing it or how do you want to approach this problem and kind of sharing and collaborating and combining people's ideas. One of the things that I'm really big on and trying to, to you know, for us to build up is there's, it's actually been shown there's five different understandings of mathematics. Everyone knows the conceptual and the procedural, but it's actually been shown that strategy adaptive reasoning, and also your um, productive disposition. Like, how do you view math? Is it something I'm good at or not good at? Is it useful? Um, can I use it in other areas? Is that positive use or like negative use? All five of those are equally important, not just do I know the concepts and can I do the formulas? So this, um, I guess, intertwined rope of all five is what we really strive to do here is to bring in all five pieces and not just any one as an emphasis. And to expand outside of the classroom, maybe more to the productive dispositions piece, uh, there's like four competitions or so that we engage our upper school students in, um, a lot of them by choice, depending if that's their interest in that kind of thing. Um, we have the American Mathematics Competition, which is usually the one that most people know, which is the AMC. Uh, this is not an easy, this is a, like an exam test, but this is not easy. This is 75 minutes, 25 item, multiple choice. Like it, it covers a range of things. There's a, a 9, 10 level and 11, 12 level. Uh, it's it's pretty expansive. Um, and on average, 30 of our, you know, say moderate to best upper school mathematicians choose to do this. We just had it um, earlier on in November and working through the scores, but that's one option that students can take if they're interested. Last year was the first St. Joe's University um, data analytics visualization composition competition. Our stat teacher took our students there and we took second place in the first one. So that was really cool. We have a Philly math league who competes against other interact schools. We're actually doing it every week. And then we're going in person this Friday um, to go up against other schools like Shipley and GA and, and all of them that are in the interact. And then something we've been starting this year in the upper school is a problem of the week that we have hanging in the hallway downstairs where students just for fun can get some candy or trophies and work on problem of the week that ranges in a variety of different topics um, that all the students can do. You don't gotta just be in an honors or AP class to tackle these. So that should give you a nice little overview. Um, and I look forward to any questions later on at the end. And I will turn this over to science. Thanks, Derek. Uh, my name is Scott Stein. I'm the head of the science department. I've been here for over 30 years. Um, so, I have a good perspective on things, and I agree 100% with everything else that people have already said about 
collaboration and teachers as guides and what it takes to be a good student. So on this slide, the, very, the first thing I want to get to really, besides our courses, is what do we want our students to be able to do when they head away from SCH and head on to head out to college? And I, what I did was um, I asked a bunch of college professors that I've had the opportunity to work with, what are they looking for when kids enter their classrooms? And if you look at the list, um, ask thoughtful questions and know how to pursue the answers, solve problems creatively, work independently and collaborate effectively, read critically and write clearly, think quantitatively, analyze real world scenarios and make thoughtful decisions relevant to their lives. When I And they, they mentioned a few very specific things for their courses, but these were the things that almost every college professor said. And when I looked at those, I said, that's SCH science. And we've been doing those things forever. So when our students leave SCH, they are so well prepared. They're the kids who in their dorm rooms, all of the other kids are coming to for help about science. In the lab, they're the ones who show the other kids how to use the equipment. And we hear that time and time again. This, this uh, webinar was perfect timing because last week, tons of our kids came back for Thanksgiving break. And when they were coming to visit, they all had similar stories. It was like music to my ears. Didn't matter what university they were at. It could have been Brown. It could have been Penn State. It could have been Penn anywhere. They're the kids that other kids are looking up to and say, man, this is easy for us. We are so well prepared. So that's kind of the, the icing on the cake. That's how I know that we're doing the, the right thing in the right way. Um, so you can see the courses that we have offered. Every student takes physics, chemistry, and biology. And then there, there's a ton of electives that they can start taking. Even in 10th grade, some kids double up. Um, and we want our kids to take all three of those electives. And if you look at the sequence, it's probably a little bit different than what you took in high school. And that's because probably in 2022, biology is the new capstone course. It's the most complex material. Kids have a good solid math background by the time they're in ninth grade now. And most high school courses in physics, first year courses are just algebra based. So our kids know enough to do physics in ninth grade, then chemistry. And we really build on chemistry and biology because if you're studying DNA and what's going on in cells, you really need some good chemistry to be able to do that. I think what impresses me also about our elective program is that a lot of kids double up in their sciences and often the kids who are doubling up in electives are kids who are not gonna be science majors. They just love our courses. They're relevant, they're challenging, they're exciting. They give kids lots of choice. And that's one of the things that we know works best for kids is kind of giving them some choice in what they're gonna pursue. Um, this next slide just shows some of our electives. And again, they can start taking them in 10th grade. Um, and we offer a pretty unique um, combination of electives. We were one of the first schools in maybe the country to start teaching forensic science. Other schools have contacted us about our elective, that elective, about our pharmacology elective. That's pretty unique. Um, our astrophysics course is unique and we make use of all of the local universities to use some of their telescopes on weekends. Um, so we have a really nice selection of courses for every student every year. So I just show this slide to show some of the toys that we get to play with um, in our science courses. And what's interesting is when I look at these and I think, oh, these are good technologies. And you probably, and if you're looking at other schools, you may have seen, oh, we're this STEM this, STEM that. And we've been STEM forever before there was such a thing as STEM. If schools are talking about their STEM, it's because it's new to them and they're probably just kind of learning how to, to do all of those things. I mean, my thought was how can you not have a great science program if you haven't been using technology, if you haven't been using engineering, if you haven't been using math, if you haven't been asking kids to read and write I mean, we've been doing those things forever. So, you know, STEM, STEAM, whatever you want to call it, all of our courses in science do that. Um, and a lot of the things on this list, these are 
college level equipment that our students start using, actually some of them in seventh grade, but all of our students get to be proficient with the tools that they need to really investigate science. I mean, if, if you look at these things, these are pieces of equipment that let kids kind of chart their own paths. All of our kids get to design their own experiments. They get to work independently. They get to work with other students. So, you know, it runs the whole spectrum of skills that they'll need to do well, both in science and non-science classes. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention were what are some things that kind of set us apart from lots of other schools and actually help kids pursue their passions. All of our students in ninth, 10th and 11th grade honors classes enter their work in external science fairs. And they do really well. They bring back medals, they bring back money, they bring back prizes, they bring back scholarships. Um, and so they love doing that because again, they're choosing the topic and deciding how I wanna do my research. Kids who aren't in honors classes also get to do independent experimental projects each year. So our kids really get to be scientists. They're not just doing hands-on scientists, hands-on science. Every school will say, oh, our kids do hands-on science. Great, you can have a really bad hands-on science program, our program is definitely minds on. So our kids really have to be thinking about how they do it, what they're doing. They're not just following kind of cookbook recipes. Um, so the science competitions and in our individual work really lets kids do that. We offer maybe 50 to 60 summer science opportunities at local and national research labs and universities. They can follow, um, again, their passions. Um, however they want to, and we help them apply. We write recommendations for them. Um, the other thing that we do is our science outreach program. Um, every year up until COVID, we were one of the few schools at the Philadelphia Science Festival Carnival on the Parkway. We still go out to some local schools and help teach younger kids about science. So for our kids who love science, we get to help them share their love of science. And then the last thing is our Collector Scientist in Residence program. That's kind of a unique endowed position where every year we have a researcher come in and not just give a speech to an assembly or to the whole school. They actually come in and work with our students for two to three days on the lab that we design with them. And then we incorporate that lab in our curriculum even after the researcher has left. So that gives kids a chance to say, yes, you know what, this could be me. And we have a special luncheon for students to have a lunch with the scientist, ask questions, figure out how they can also follow their dreams. So those are, that's kind of an outline of our courses and some of the special events that we have. So I will pass my the slides over to Steph Kasten. I'm head of the World Language Department. Bonsoir tout le monde. <laughs> um, as Scott just said, I'm Stephanie Caston, and um, I have been here, I think we're going on 22 years. Um, I've taught in middle and upper school as well. I also have had children go through. Um, one of the things I, first of all, I, I'm going completely off script here because um, one of the things that I'm so excited about is a word that Dr. Dinkins uses often and um, having him here and hearing the word vigor is what kept coming to mind when I was listening to all my great um, colleagues talking about uh, their what they do in, um, in their programs. And I kind of was taking a lot of notes during that time, just thinking, okay, we're kind of like, um, Fred Astaire and the language department is the Ginger Rogers, where we do all of those things as well, except we're doing it backwards and um, in heels, except for it's just in another language. So imagine all the things that people were talking about in English. There was like the way we go through how our kids are acquiring languages. They're starting with the individual, then they move to their local environment and then the world. Um, when I heard about history, we are always doing things, um, reading, um, analyzing text, 
having textual text-based evidence. Um, again, this is all in another language as well. Um, and uh, grappling with the messiness of history, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you some examples of that um, in just a second. Uh, we touch in art, we are, our languages cover all of the five major continents. So that's something that definitely helps us um, stand out. Um, we also talk about making history and stories in general, because in the word in French, I'm a French teacher, but I also um, we also have Spanish, Chinese, and Latin. Um, and the word story is the same word as um, history in French. So, and there's a reason why. So you're trying to make all of those things relevant to our students' lives. Um, in math, I even found some uh, some similarities there where we're about revisiting uh, placements and taking risks and collaboration. And of course, with science, um, uh, some of the things that make, I think, all of this together a really vigorous experience for us and for our students um, is, uh, for example, all of the people I've ever met when I'm working, when we go abroad, um, that are from the United States, they're almost all scientists. So that's one really beautiful combination. If kids can continue through both their sciences and their languages, that really is going to end up probably being helpful in the long run. So I'll stop gabbing. That was me going off script. I'm, I apologize. But I just couldn't help but um, point out some of those, connect some of those dots for all of you. Um, so you've had a chance to look at our why, how, and what we do. Um, basically, I um I would say that the why is what gets us up out of bed every morning and hopefully your the students as well. Um, how we do it, we love to tell stories. We love to create stories with the students. Um, we do a lot with um, current events. And what we do is we create target language communicators and um, which I will and we'll do that with a little TLC. So um, this is our progression. Um, we begin in third grade. Now, obviously, your children will not be beginning in third grade, but um, uh, in ninth and twelfth, um, new students coming in either start with a uh, a new a level one class, or they'll be placed into um, a level two, or whatever fits their needs. Is we'll make sure that they're placed appropriately. Um, so that they can acquire the language at the level where, where they're feeling confident, but also um, pretty competent in, in what it is that they're with and challenged as well with, with what they're doing. Um, if you'll notice in the little box on the bottom right here, whenever you're, the SCH students arrive, um, they find themselves moving up through these proficiency levels. Um, and uh, into intermediate low and beyond is uh, that's our requirement to get through to intermediate low. Um, some of the things that we do have to do with, uh, it's not just about language, it's about cultures. It's about making those cultural comparisons, being culturally competent, also making connections. So with other disciplines, and I'm gonna show you some examples of this, um, comparing what we are living with where other people are living in um, in other places, and also just kind of making the community um, so that you're able to communicate with whatever community it is that you are in. Um, here are some of the things that I found, like I just mentioned all the other things that I found that we have a lot of connections with in regards to our other academic courses. But we also share a lot with what happens in our CEL, Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. These are some of the traits that we share. And I would I would beg to say that everybody in our um, all of our departments share these same traits. Um, ours are just sometimes a little more visible in uh, in some of the things that we do. So these world readiness standards notice that the first one there's five we call them the five c's the first one is about communication it's actually about speaking but there are four others that are just as important that i just quickly went over but i'm going to take you in and show you some examples of interpretive communication interpersonal and presentational um this is a, a recent project that we did in one of my classes that um where after 200 years um, the boy on the right in the rear, um, who was an enslaved boy um, in Louisiana, 
Um, our, this is our kids were detectives trying to figure out what the heck happened there on the left, where you see that he is not in the image. Um, he was covered up for about 400 years. And after to this year, after exactly 200 years since his birth, um, we were they were able to discover who he was um, and bring him from erasure back into the spotlight. Um, and he's this whole painting. Uh, we went through many steps to get through this story so that they could do that detective work and come up with what happened, where did it start, who is he, and why is this still relevant. Um, so here's an example. We start, they had, they did not see the picture on the left, the painting, but I was describing it to them. Uh, they were interpreting what I was saying and they were drawing it without seeing the image. And then uh, like the next week they saw the image and I'm, we're describing what's in it. And they were like, oh, there were literal gasps. They were like, wait, that's the painting we were just doing. And I know you can see it looks nothing the same, but you get the, the idea that they, they followed the directions, what was going on. Um, interpersonal communication. Um, is when they're talking to each other. Um, so back and forth, it's not rehearsed. Um, um, I don't think we probably have time to actually play this, but you can see kids like talking to each other. They don't have all of the, um, uh, they're not doing this a scripted way, but it's things that they've been um, working on, things that they're familiar with, but without any script. Um, and then here in the presentational communication, these were the can-do statements, what the kids are able to do at the end. This was our summative assessment, um, a presentational communication, um, and they got to decide what, how deep they wanted to go with what it was that they wanted to cover as their driving idea for their last project um, based on that painting. Um, so... Um, we also bring in lots of, this is like to lead up to all this, we talk about like who was here before us, um, bringing in the cultural pieces from way back and also how they're still um, touching us today. Um, we connect also with a lot of history, as you can see here, um, making comparisons uh, about language, about like um, cognates, um, cultures, reaching out to our communities, whether it's online, talking with the um, with the collector of this painting, and um, using like this local language acquisition. These are all things I realize that this article here is in English, but this is a um, primary source that we uh, were able to look at to find out about um, how this all came to be and why he was covered up and why he wasn't uncovered until uh, just very recently. Um, so we bring kids in. We've had some one of our science st um, uh, students that went on to be a um, in med school, who's also fluent in another language, came in and spoke with classes. So we have we invite alums in. Here's something that everybody loves to hear about. Um, these are some of the places that we go um, on every major continent, as I said. Um, so these are places that we either go or have gone with our uh, language students. Um, here's just a quick example. And when we go, we're not just getting on a tour bus. We're embedding with host families, um, collaborating before, during, and after, um, and negotiating. This is like their game day, right? They finally get to go out and play. This is in Senegal a few years ago, right before COVID, actually. Um, and to finish up, our kids are excited to test the language and competency, comfortable balancing this, like you have a lot of ambiguity. You never, you don't always have the right answer. Um, and they're always um, prepared to make meaningful contributions. This is just my little play on word, target language communicators. We do that with TLC. So that is always our hope. That is our goal. And um, the woman in the middle of this picture, by the way, with some of our students, um, wrote, uh, had a book written about her that we now read in class. So, um, and she's a graffiti artist in Senegal. So um, thank you. And I'll let um, uh, Carly take it over from here.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of your, all the information uh, about each of our departments and just being so passionate and excited about what you and your, your colleagues are teaching um, in each department. So, so thank you for sharing a little bit about uh, what families can expect. So this is now an opportunity for families to submit questions. A couple have been asked. Um, so uh, if you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature to submit any questions. I'm going to put the my group back on the screen so that anyone can kind of chime in at any point. Um, a question that was asked, how do you place students in their history and science classes, honors or CP? What is the evaluation process when they come into ninth grade from other schools? Sarah, do you, do you want me to go first or? Sure, why don't you go, Scott? Sure. Um, we usually look at recommendations from teachers. We look at any standardized test scores. We look at their math placement scores because that actually is the best correlation with our ninth grade physics program. Um, it's almost a perfect match. And so to be in honors physics, you really should be in honors math. So it's a, it, it's a good connection. And then we also try to take into account student passions, student interests. Um, but we really want the fit to be where the student is going to do his or her best work and continue to love science and the rest of their subjects. And the only thing I would add is that we absolutely don't look at math placement in history, uh, but we look at all the other things as well as the grades they were getting, the if they were leveled at their old school, what level they were at at their old school, um, uh, and that kind of thing. But everything else, I think, is the same. Another question was asked, can you take more than one language at the same time? For example, Latin one and Spanish two in ninth grade. Hi, so um, in ninth grade, we are not able to do that because we have something that other schools don't have with the Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. So what they can do is they can add a second language in 11th grade um, or in 12th grade, but there's not room in their schedule um, to be able to um, add one in ninth. Thank you. Uh, another question that has been asked in advance was, can you explain what homework looks like for students uh, at the school, uh, specifically ninth graders? Um, so how much homework can students expect in your classes, hypothetically? I can try and jump on that one first. Um, so I think, uh, <clears throat> always like the, on, on average, so, <clears throat> I'd say probably depending on the student, you're probably looking at maybe 30 to 45 minutes the, the per class meeting time. So remember our classes only meet five out of the seven days of the cycle. So it's not like if you have a skip day where you don't see class that you're gonna get double the amount of homework because you have two days to do it. It would still be the same amount, but I'd say anywhere from 30 to 45, but the, the caveat I would add for math and maybe other chairs would say the same thing for their subject is, I've been teaching math for 12 years and I've been five years at SCH. I could say that a homework assignment is supposed to take 30 or 45 minutes, but that does vary by student and where they're at. Um, so one of the things that I usually say or math teachers will say is, you know, shoot for 30, 45 minutes. If you get to an hour mark and you're stuck, then we're looking, you can come in for support and things like that. Like we don't want anyone, you know, you know, kind of beating their head against the wall, trying to figure out something if they can't get help to do it. So for math, I'd say we shoot for that, but if a student really needs it, or if they take way less, um, we always try to have some optional challenge pieces on there too, to help balance that out. And I can say like for English courses, you know, obviously we want students to be reading. So they're typically engaged in a text and will be reading, um, you know, pieces of a novel or a short story. Um, and then we also, you know, one thing I realized I didn't cover much in my slides, but it's important that I think is a real cornerstone of SCH English classes is how we teach annotating and annotation. So students really interact with the books they're reading. You know, students, um, we supply students with copies of their own novels and texts, and we teach them really starting in middle school how to annotate for 
you know, plot and setting and conflict and characterization and figurative language. So, you know, when we do assign reading for students, um, annotations and response questions are built into that. So I wouldn't say there's a given sort of time frame, but um, I think teachers are generally pretty, you know, conscientious of all of the work that upper schoolers have and work with, you know, within those confines to make sure students aren't overwhelmed with what they're doing. Thank you. Um, another question was asked, how, uh, excuse me, are any courses taught in an interdisciplinary fashion, for example, English and history? We, uh, I'll take that one if uh, and anybody else who wants to chime in. So we don't teach interdisciplinary courses. We do um, um, kind of cross. Um, so for instance, in 10th grade, we teach about the Haitian revolution. Um, and um, we uh, we have coordinated a lot with the language department who who also teach about the Haitian Revolution, but in French. <laughs> um, and it's been a really it's great. The kids are so jazzed um, about that connection um, and they can see the parallels and it's a much richer experience that way. And history, they read the the book Night, which is a Holocaust memoir, and we teach the Holocaust. So we, we support each other, but we don't teach in an interdisciplinary way. Uh, I might add, um, right before COVID, we actually were beginning a program, Becky wasn't here yet, with the 11th grade English teachers in biology because they were reading Angels in America. And at the same time, we were teaching a unit on the immune system and HIV. And the kids freaked out. They couldn't believe that we knew what what was going on in other subjects, and it was and it was all connecting. And so it was so powerful. I'm hoping to go back to it now because during COVID, our focus on the immune system was COVID and understanding that and what's going on. But I'm hoping to swing back to working with the English teachers in 11th grade bio at the end of the year because it's just a great way to as a culmination to both courses. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Scott. I was going to say that um, something that I'm working on as the English chair is real is looking at the scope and sequence of the English curriculum. And then, you know, I one of my goals is talking with all of these wonderful colleagues of mine about what is happening in their curriculums to see if we can find more places to cross over and intersect. Um, so thanks for asking that question. Great questions. Um, another question was asked about our art program. And so I'm just going to do a plug real quick about the arts. So next Monday, December 5th, we actually have an arts and new media information session happening similar to, similar to this. Um, so you can register for that event on our website and that will give you the opportunity to learn all about the art opportunities with, at, at SCH. Um, just so that you are aware, uh, in ninth grade, one of the areas where your child gets to differentiate their academic schedule is the art program. There's a CEL program that's built in and students get to choose two CEL classes, but they also get to choose their art uh, credits. And so that is an area that um, we have a wealth of opportunities um, within the elective program for students to be doing more traditional fine arts, uh, ceramics, woodworking, 2D and 3D dimensional art, as well as more multimedia, new media offerings, such as uh, songwriting, animation, gaming design, um, art architectural design. So there are a number of classes that your child would be able to explore within the arts over the course of four years. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything to that. I sure. do. I do. Um, so one of my sons um, is, was, is an artist and was so supported and enriched by the art program. And in fact, those two colorful pictures are painted by him in the art program here at SCH. So they, it, it's so creative and wonderful and they gave him space to be who he was and it was a wonderful, wonderful program. Thanks, Sarah. So um, it's six o'clock. I am going to conclude the event for, for our department chairs and for our families. I will give one more, one more, one more plug to families just because um, 
I always like to push back to our website. I think our website has so many resources that are worth um, exploring further. And on the upper school webpage, so if you were to go to sch.org, explore grades, upper school specific, and scroll down, you will see that there are videos highlighting um, the academic experience. Uh, academics from department chairs, and you can even click on each department and actually see the robust offerings academically. So I highly encourage you to check this out so that you can see the classes your child could be taking. Um, if you scroll all the way down, you've got the complete curriculum guide. You have an example of the student schedule so that you can see what does a school day look like for our students, as well as additional information on other things that obviously families will find very useful, be it college counseling, our Outward Bound program, things like that. Um, so yes, this was fantastic. Thank you everyone for being here. I loved hearing uh, all of the information that you were able to share. I learned some new things. Hopefully our families learned some new things about SCH. If anyone has questions for anybody here, um, many of you have my email, you can reach out to me and I'm happy to put you in touch with any of the department chairs or just get you the answers that you may have. Um, somebody did ask earlier about visiting. Um, if you are interested in applying for the 23-24 school year, please submit an application. After we submit, Once you submit an application, we can move forward with scheduling a full day visit for your child. If you want to tour, there's opportunities for you to come into our campus at any time. So also feel free to reach out to the admission office and we can move forward with scheduling a, a tour of the campus for you. So uh, again, thank you so much to our families for joining us. Scott, Steph, Derek, Becky, uh, and Sarah, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Take care. <laughs>